congratulations, Jim, and thank you for everything that you've done. We wouldn't be as far as we are without you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Danforth, for your remarks, and thank you all uh, in attendance. We have a full house, all of our scientists, staff, friends, volunteers, and supporters. Uh, we have some special guests here. You're all special, um, but, but I'll point out a few as we go along. Uh, before my remarks about the State of the Center, I want to recognize one more person who has served us so well, and that is our outgoing chairman of our Friends Committee. For the past two years, Jay Noose has worked tirely to chair quarterly meetings, host lunches, uh, and on occasions too numerous to mention, represent the Danforth Center, the Friends, our volunteers. Um, we wouldn't be as far without Jay Noose as we are today. In fact, Jay, uh, you follow on uh, and hand over uh, the chairmanship of the Friends Committee to a terrific individual, Molly Klein. Uh, but before we do that, Jay, please stand up and be recognized. Well, as all of you know, most of you know, I think, the needs to feed and power a growing, changing world while also preserving the environment and vital natural resources are among our greatest global challenges. Sustainably providing for over nine billion people by the, million of, uh, by the middle of the century uh, is a daunting task. It's gonna require that we increase available food by at least 50%, dramatically lower the environmental footprint of agriculture, and achieve a major shift toward renewable sources of energy. Over the next 40 years, the world needs to produce more food than all that was produced in agriculture over the last 8,000 years combined. That means worldwide productivity will need to increase by roughly 50%, but without any more land and without more water dedicated to agriculture, with fewer greenhouse gas emissions, and we'll need to do it in the face of climate change and escalating problems with pests and diseases. These challenges, and this is a scary thought, these challenges are not solvable in a sustainable way using current capacity, current systems, and current technology. But make no mistake, these are not only year 2050 challenges. These are today challenges. Consider a couple of facts. Today, nearly 900 million people are food insecure around the world. An alarming 26 billion tons of topsoil is already being lost every year from primarily agricultural land. Erosion rates are about 10 times higher than soil replenishment rates. It's 10, 10 times in this country. Go to India and it's three to four times higher. Agriculture already contributes 10% of our overall greenhouse gas emissions. That needs to come down. And 70% of all water that we use on Earth for uh, society is already used for agriculture, primarily for irrigation. Water is a particularly improved, uh, intriguing problem for two major reasons as we go forward. Rainfall will become less predictable in agricultural growing regions, and water will become a more competitive, a more depleted, a more restricted, and a more expensive natural resource. Just to put some reality on the needs for water, I've got this fun chart that I'd like you to have a look at. How much water does it take to produce some things that all of you consume, most of you consume? Uh, it takes 14 gallons of water to produce one orange. All right, that's not so bad. Oranges are pretty good, I like oranges. Uh, put another way, uh, if you went to your kitchen, turn your faucet on full blast, you'd have to run your faucet for about five and a half minutes to put out the water to make one orange. 28 gallons or just over 11 minutes to produce an avocado. Uh, a loaf of bread, okay, now we're talking some serious water here. 150 gallons to produce one loaf of bread. That's running your faucet for 60 minutes on a high. We haven't even got to meat. It takes 400 gallons to raise one chicken. Turn your kitchen faucet on for almost three hours. Uh, but if you wanna have a hamburger, or better yet, if you want to have a hamburger for your family of four, you need, for that one hamburger, about 4,000 
uh, uh, you need 1,020 um, uh, uh, gallons, or the amount of time running your faucet for almost seven hours to make that one hamburger, family of four, goes up to over 4,000. Um, for that one hamburger, if you want to put tomato on it, it's 1,021. <laughs> so the reason I mentioned tomatoes, it only takes three gallons to raise a tomato. That's actually why we study tomatoes. Tomatoes are pretty water efficient. It's a fascinating crop. Meeting global challenges at the nexus of food, water, and energy today and tomorrow will require significant new investment in science and technology. We can't get where we need to be with today's tools. That's what motivates us every day at the Danforth Center. Now, if the center does its part, we'll understand better how plants work in changing environments, drier environments, for example. Uh, we'll use that technology to improve productivity and sustainability of food, energy, and industrial crops. We'll develop technologies that are taken up by the private sector, but we'll also give that technology to those most in need in developing regions, and we'll help create innovative startups and attract leading edge companies to the region. And we'll produce well-trained plant scientists who will guide the next generation. These are the outcomes that matter to us. How are we doing it? How do we ensure that our work and our output, our activities, lead to important outcomes? The magic ingredient, the secret in the sauce, is teamwork, collaboration, and partnership, our theme today. You need to understand that science, our primary function is a team sport. That's because scientific research, building new technologies, and solving problems are really, really hard. They require teams of interactive scientists, mathematicians, statisticians, engineers, practitioners, and educators. Teams at the Danforth Center develop unique platforms for discovery, application, and outreach. And then we partner with organizations that are best positioned in the region, the country, and the world to solve real problems where they exist. We were very productive in 2014. Our research programs made amazing discoveries. I'll talk about a few today that were described and disseminated in 99 journal articles. That's a record for us. We advanced several crop improvement programs through 10 important field trials in three different countries. We were successful competing for grants, 13.9 million for the year, another record, and in training our young scientists. In fact, we hosted our 529th trainee since inception. And through our science education program, again, which I'll talk about later, we reached 1,968 students in 38 schools 16 of which were City of St. Louis public schools. And it was nearly all done in collaborative teams. 88% of our published research articles were collaborative works between two or more labs or institutions. Two thirds of our grant funding was for multi-institutional collaborative projects. And as I'll discuss later, much of our education and outreach involves team comprised of education and outreach professionals, and scientists in our labs. For us, collaboration is bedrock. In fact, if you chart who interacts with who at the Danforth Center, which is shown up here, you get this fascinating map that shows we are a large interconnected network. Now, what I'm showing up here is what we call a network map. There's a dot for all of the scientists at the center if it's red, it's one of our PIs. If it's blue, it's one of the rest of our scientific staff, postdoctoral scientists, graduate students, technicians, and others. If you're green up here, you're a collaborating partner at another institution. Noah Fallgren produced this map yesterday. What it shows is that we function in teams. Oops, excuse me. This cluster down here. That's our international crop improvement program. That's showing actually three different projects or clusters that are happening in teams at the Danforth Center to improve one of eight food security crops. Right here, that's the team that's working to develop camelina and other seed crops as an alternative source of jet fuel. 
Up here, I could tell all of our scientists are looking at this and saying, where am I, where am I on this map? <laughs> this is a cluster that is working on a Department of Energy program uh, that is spearheaded by Ivan Baxter, Tom Brittnell, and Todd Mockler, those three of whom are right there. And they connect with this big mass here, which I'll talk with in just a moment. We have some individual labs out here who connect with their PI. That's my lab, and that's me. <laughs> the point of this, we work in teams, but those teams are interconnected. So let me to give you a few examples of the power of team at the Danforth Center. First, one of our favorite teams, the Bellwether Phenotyping Team. This is a remarkable group that has developed a new platform for discovery to understand how environment interacts with plants, plant genetics, to affect plant performance. That's what phenotype is, the collective uh, set of properties that define plant performance. The team involves 21 people from seven labs and two core facilities at the center. Where does it fit in here? That's this cluster right here, this dense uh, convergence of many people. The phenotyping team, coupled with another group I'll mention uh, in a few minutes, is at the center of activity here at the Danforth Center. In 2014, that cluster, those 21 individuals, took a new automated system to continuously measure plant traits and turned it into a productive tool that works around the clock. They tackled the issue of water initially. More specifically, they tackled the problem of why some plants are more sensitive to drought than others. They studied the difference in drought sensitivity. Uh, don't worry, I'm not going to get into any data. Uh, this is just a gee whiz wow slide uh, showing you that we can collect lots of data with the bellwether system. They studied the differences in drought sensitivity between a domesticated, that is a crop, and a wild species, that is something that we collected out in a native landscape, uh, domesticated and wild species of Ceteria, which includes, it's a type of millet. Work here at the center is diving deep into the genetic variation of Ceteria from different geographies. The team captured nearly 80,000 images over four weeks using three types of cameras, and then they mined information about nine traits using computer vision software that was developed right here at the center. They discovered that different Ceteria species respond differently over time to low water conditions, and that this is a genetically programmed trait that affects plant growth. That's important information that breeders can use to improve millet, an important food security crop for millions in the semi-arid tropics. Many of the Bellwether phenotyping team are also part of the maker team, a group of 45 Danforth Center scientists, staff, and trainees who are spearheading the design and construction of low-cost instruments and software engineering tools to address specific research needs. The maker group helps with cross-disciplinary training for postdoctoral scientists, graduate students, technicians, uh, even old people like me, uh, and even high school students and others. Uh, the cross-disciplinary training uh, is at the nexus of computer science engineering, and it uses tools like 3D printing, uh, and some outcomes are things like instrument prototypes. Maker instruments are low cost, but accurate sensors and cameras, and other devices connected to cheap $35 Raspberry Pi computers. You'll like this one, Roger. They're alternatives to expensive commercial equipment. And as you know, that expensive commercial equipment can run into the millions of dollars. And they're adaptable to both laboratory and field settings. On the screen is an example of an ultra-sensitive fluorescence imaging system that Meter Nusenau built to show spread of a virus in two infected plants, the plants at 2 o'clock and 8 o'clock. Over 60% of the labs, as well as the education and outreach program, are using uh, 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 maker instruments or building maker tools or using uh, maker approaches in education and outreach. And our new building will have a dedicated collaborative maker space to encourage and expand this program. Several team members are bringing the Danforth Center maker movement uh, or, or taking it out of the center and bringing it to the public. That's going to happen this Saturday at the first Raspberry Pi Jam here at the center. 
can go online and learn more about this. By the way, you're all invited. The event, which currently has over 250 registrants, we're not sure how we're going to fit them all in, uh, but we encourage every one of them, will provide an unintimidating atmosphere to introduce plant science, computer science, and the maker culture to the public. The jam includes tours, demonstrations, uh, robots, learn to solder stations, and much more. You're all welcome, as I mentioned. Now, I want to recognize some of the key people who are leading both the Bellwether phenotyping uh, team, the Maker team, and the Raspberry Pi Jam, uh, which will occur on Saturday. So uh, when I call your name, please stand. And after they're all standing, please give them a round of applause. Dimitri Nusenow, Ivan Baxter, Malia Guillen, Noah Falgren, Carrie Gilbert, Mindy Wilson, and Tom Britnell. Please stand. Some of our teams join even larger consortia. This is the case for three of our PIs, Todd Mockler, Chris Topp, and Terry Woodford-Thomas, who joined with 31 investigators from nine other Missouri institutions in a large $20 million National Science Foundation funded program called Missouri Transect. This project, which is led by the University of Missouri Columbia, of which we have at least four uh, representatives today, uh, this project is building infrastructure and knowledge to understand the impact of changing environments on agriculture and native landscapes. Already, this project has resulted in development and testing of instrumentation to better image roots, root metabolism in real time, and as the needs intensify for uh, lower water use in agriculture, understanding root biology will be an important route to develop new traits uh, that enable crops to use water more efficiently. With the Missouri Transect team of Todd Mockler, Chris Topp, and Terry Woodford Thomas, and Sandra Arango Caro, please stand up and be recognized. The Missouri Transect Project has brought us closer to key collaborators and partners like, like Robert Pless, a leading expert in computer vision and image analytics at Washington University. Ties have been strengthened, uh, most importantly, for the, in the case of Missouri Transect, with Mizzou. And this eventually helped lead us to our recently announced agreement to hire four joint faculty between the Danforth Center and Mizzou, two of which will be housed here and two of which will be housed on the Mizzou campus. So thank you, uh, Tom, Mark, and others at Mizzou uh, for making that happen. Our education and outreach program has never been stronger, thanks to the tremendous efforts of Terry Woodford Thomas, our Dreamire Director of Science Education. So let me introduce you to the STEAM team. Eight of our scientists working to engage more young women in science, technology, engineering, arts, and mathematics, or STEAM fields. In June, the team will lead Girls STEAM Ahead 2015, a partnership with the Girl Scouts of Eastern Missouri. I know we have a number who participated specifically in the Girl Scouts of Eastern Missouri here in the audience. Girls STEAM Ahead will bring 80 Girl Scouts from the city of St. Louis, St. Louis County, and rural areas to the community college labs at Bridge Park. Over three days, Girl Scouts will work with our scientist mentors to hone their STEAM skills by doing experiments that support creativity, build confidence, and promote communication. The STEAM team is Sona Pandy, Becky Bart, Andrea Eveland, our newest, uh, oops, excuse me, our newest investigator, pictured right here with two Girl Scouts, Toby Kellogg, Sarah Fentress, Terry Woodford Thomas, Malia Guillen, and Tony Kuchon. Would you please stand and be recognized? Our role in building the region as a world center for plant science innovation is entirely collaborative and team-oriented. On our campus, Bridge Park now has, houses 14 companies in the St. Louis Community College lab training program. As many of you know, Bridge Park was selected as the new home for a major North American research center for the German seed company KWS. 
Yes, they wanted to be near the Danforth Center. Yes, they wanted to interact with our scientists and use our facilities. But they also wanted to be part of what they expressed as a unique St. Louis innovation ecosystem. Last week, I and many of you were able to attend the grand opening of their new laboratory office uh, and conference facilities over in Bridge. Very nice facility. It, it underwent a $6 million redesign and renovation. Contains new labs and other, uh, other facilities uh, and that very importantly will house 75 new people to the region, to Bridge, uh, within the next few years. We're very excited about that. Although we're not making any formal announcements this morning, stay tuned because we will, over the next few months, uh, uh, look for some news about new companies and new organizations that are going to find their way to this campus. On the startup side, Helix Center, our neighboring plant and ag technology incubator run by the St. Louis Economic Partnership, achieved full occupancy in its phase one build out. This important Bridge Park sister facility plays a vital role in growing early stage companies that will one day perhaps graduate to Bridge Park. Three of our Helix tenants Benson Hill Biosystems, Cultivat, and um, uh, Arvigenics were either started by or have close research ties to past or present Danforth Center scientists. And we were thrilled to see Yield Lab, uh, Thad, congratulations. Uh, we were thrilled to see Yield Lab, an accelerator for ag startup companies, get off the ground at Helix uh, over the past 12 months. And we're proud to report that the success of the sixth annual Ag Innovation Showcase, held in September and attended by 350 investors, entrepreneurs, and strategic representatives in the ag tech space, uh, we were thrilled to host that for the sixth time here at the Danforth Center. Since inception, companies presenting at Ag Showcase have raised more than $360 million in financing. And two of our Bridge Park companies New Leaf Symbiotics, uh, which recently closed a $17 million Series B round, and Symico, which shipped its first commercial product this year, uh, have been featured companies in the past. Uh, we look to the Ag Showcase not only as a way to promote the ecosystem here, but to attract companies from outside the region, build awareness, particularly among strategics and investment partners. So, in closing, I hope I've communicated adequately that the Danforth Center succeeds, that it delivers on its mission only when people with diverse backgrounds and talent come together for common purposes. The culture of collaboration, of we, is important to us. We talk about it and promote it constantly. It makes us unique in the scientific world. As we grow with the addition of the next building, due for completion in November, our challenge is not only to recruit the very best scientists, but to grow the very best teams. We seek not only high achieving researchers, but entrepreneurs who understand that turning discovery into impact requires vision, risk, and partnership. The expansion, the expansion project is about providing our current and future scientific teams with best in class facilities and equipment and with spaces that enable what is not currently possible. The expansion is designed to ensure greater impact in the years ahead, but this will not happen without your partnership and without your support. Thank you very much.